Episode 5 of the Irish Economics Podcast takes on energy economics. We go through recent changes in the Irish electricity market and discuss whether they have been for the best. We discuss innovation economics and policies that we need to get new technologies on stream. And we wrap up by asking the question, are we all going to become electricity traders? Welcome to episode five of the Irish Economics Podcast. So today's episode is on energy economics and for this episode we're going to take a slightly different format. You're going to hear a number of guest voices this week as well as my own and there are two contributors that I would like to introduce. So first of all I will be joined by Dr. Jacqueline Pless of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT. So Jacqueline is assistant professor at the Sloan School of Management and is an expert when it comes to innovation policy and innovation economics and analysing policies that are designed to incentivize the development of new technologies. So this will be very useful when it comes to getting an insight into, well, what sort of policies do we need to get these new technologies that we need for decarbonisation in particular? Alongside that, I'll be joined by Murren Lynch, Dr. Murren Lynch, who is a research officer at the Economic and Social Research Institute. So you'll probably remember Murren from our carbon tax episode and Murren Her primary role at the ESRI is that of energy economist and Myrne has a wealth of information when it comes to the Irish market so we'll be able to draw on that for part of this discussion also. What else is different about this episode? Well, during the week I sent a a tweet out to everybody to try and see what sort of topics are of interest to other people. I know what's of interest to me, I have an idea of what might be of interest to listeners but it it would be great to get some insight from well, what do people actually want to hear. And it was great to get some nice messages in that regard. So I've tried to incorporate that into this discussion as best I can. So how will this proceed then? Well, maybe I should give you just a rundown of the agenda. So first of all, we'll discuss the market. What exactly is the electricity market? How the market has developed from maybe the old days of uh, the old ESP. I'll then discuss, well, what impact renewables is have, sort of the drive for renewables. Um, people have different concepts of how the electricity system will work as we approach, you know, f- full renewable penetration. And I'll try and maybe explain different aspects of this, how new technologies will be important. And that leads us nicely on to, well, how do we get those new technologies? And I'll draw on uh, Jacqueline's expertise in that regard. The next step then is to look at the future, look at uh, how the market will develop. Finally, then I'll wrap up with a bonus message, uh, primarily for policymakers to try and say, well, these are all nice ideas and these are all things we sort of we need to do if we're taking climate change seriously, especially. But in order to get there, there's a few policy levers that need to come in place. So that's something I'll wrap up with. OK, so the first topic on our agenda is that of the electricity market. And we'll start by discussing the development of the electricity market and how we got to where we are today and hopefully learn something about the economics of electricity markets in the process. So electricity in Ireland began in the late 1800s, around 1880 or so, where electric lighting was beginning to become a common feature around towns and cities. Um, Now, interestingly enough, around this time, electricity was not served by one national organisation like the ESB. Each town or each locality had its own generation company and this is one of the tasks that the early free state had to deal with well how do we organize electricity how do how do we provide a reliable supply and they looked to the u.s for inspiration and in the u.s what tended to happen was a lot of centralized generation so this led to the establishment of the electricity supply board in 1927 now one interesting thing about the esb back then was the structure the structure of electricity of the ESB incorporated all elements of electricity supply. It it started when the coal was put in the furnace and it ended when the light was switched on in, in the home or wherever electricity was used. It was a vertically integrated structure. And with hindsight, we can see, well, this actually was a good thing because back then we had all these separate entities in different locations and ESB took control and said, right, well, we're taking control of everything. We're making one market in all of Ireland and that meant that they standardised the system throughout uh, the free state at the time. So why was this a good thing? Well, if they didn't do that, do it then, they probably would have had to do it later on. 
So therefore, it was good to nip that in the bud, get a standardized system in early on. So in the early days, we had Arden and Crusher, 1927, I think 27, 29, around about then was when Arden and Crusher came online. We had one other generation station, a coal-fired station in the Pigeon House in Dublin. And that was the vast majority of, of supply for a long time. So this stayed pretty stable until the 1950s, where additional um, gener- generation was required. We'd exhausted all our hydro. We didn't want to be overexposed to coal because during the war years, um, there was rationing of coal and therefore this would create an additional risk. So the Irish uh, government at that stage then turned to peat and this had a trade-off basically. Peat, even back then, peat, it was known that it was much more expensive. For example, I read somewhere that the volume of milled peat required to produce the same amount, one unit of electricity was eight times that of coal. So as you can see, there's so much more inputs required for the same output. It's so much more inefficient. And this alongside the fact that there was other costs involved and alongside the fact that it had to be uh, located in remote Midlands areas. Now, this might have been a negative in terms of cost, but it was a positive in terms of creating employment in these areas. And at the time, then the policymakers thought, well, the employment benefits plus the security supply benefits outweigh the additional cost. And we went repeat. So this then stayed pretty much the same until the 70s and 80s, where we had a growth in demand once more with economic growth, and we needed more electricity. With oil crisis throughout this period, again, it was going back to the whole issue of diversification. The Irish Irish government, they weren't too enamoured with putting all their eggs in the oil basket, so so oil was, was pretty much off the table. When looking at the other options, one option was nuclear, and this was considered for a while. There was plans drawn up for a generation station at Carnesore Point, but we'll all, we're all familiar with the fact that there was a lot of protests around that, and this was just taken off the table forever. Nuclear is now illegal in Ireland. So given these developments then, coal seemed to be the front runner, and Money Point was commissioned. So this was commissioned around the 1980s, and the fact that they chose coal at the time was not necessarily a bad thing. However, one mistake they did made, make was it, it had a much greater capacity than what was required at the time. They had to forecast what the demand was going to be throughout the lifetime of the plant. And Fiat Gaffney and colleagues at UCC have a nice paper where they claim that the ESP did their own macroeconomic forecasts and they got it wrong and ended up thinking, well, demand was going to increase uh, to a much greater extent than what it actually did. And therefore, Ireland was shouldered with a burden of carrying this capacity that they didn't really need. So these forecasts are made in 1980. Money Point then came on stream in 1987 in the middle of a time of poor economic performance. So what were the consequences of this? Well, we had ex- excess capacity. Remember, the ESB is a national body. If they make a good call, the consumer benefits. If they make a bad call, well, the consumer loses out. They made a bad call. The consumer had to lose out. How did the consumer lose out? Well, we had to shoulder this additional cost through uh, higher electricity prices and the obvious impact of this was that well, householders had to pay higher uh, prices for their goods and services, and that had a negative effect. But also, so did to the industry and uh, and commerce, and especially back then when a lot of industry would have been perhaps um, you know manufacturing industry, a lot of energy intensive processes. Well, they weren't going to come to Ireland if the cost of electricity was really high. So that would have had an effect and would have meant we were less competitive on, on the market when it came to uh, attracting industry to Ireland. So we had to shoulder that burden for the next uh, 20 years or so. A lot of people would argue, well, why do we have a liberalised market? Why, why do we allow competition and private companies to compete? Why don't we just have the ESB? Well, this whole example of money point and the excess capacity is one example of, of why this can hurt consumers because this excess capacity decision is one that hurt consumers because we had a nationalised company. Basically, if this was a private company and they took, they made the wrong call, well, the consumer isn't going to lose out. The company is going to lose out. They might, you know, they might go through the wall or whatever. But by having a liberalised market, we're not exposing electricity consumers to these sort of risks. And, and that can be a good thing. Now, there are other risks and we'll, we'll touch on that later on. But uh, that's one thing to highlight. So the second query then was, how do electricity markets work? So the liberalised market in Ireland was motivated by EU legislation to establish common rules for a European electricity market, but also because lower electricity prices were observed in other markets. 
that had increasing levels of private electricity generation. Now, the liberalised all-Ireland market of both Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic came to being in 2007, and that, that was known as the single electricity market. And the whole idea of the single electricity market came about by this concept of unbundling. So as we mentioned, the old ESB, that was a vertically integrated structure. So what unbundling does is it unbundles each element of that vertical integration. So it takes out the generation side, it takes out the supply side, takes out the distribution side and treats each one individually. And if you can make a market out of each one, well, then a market will be made, there'll be competition and hopefully the price will fall. The single electricity market then, that was developed for the for the um the wholesale side for the generation side and basically unbundling and liberalization works well if you have either good competition or good regulation that can emulate competition now in the uk this didn't happen so well and i'll probably devote a whole episode to discussing the uk situation because it's quite interesting but suffice to say for the time being that there was neither enough competition or enough regulation to emulate competition and the benefits of competition were not reaped. Now in Ireland, this was an example of something that went really well. The single electricity market had very good regulations that meant that generators had to reveal their costs and by revealing their costs, they had to act as if they were in a competitive environment, even though there was not an abundance of generators. Now, there was sufficient generators to avoid any sort of unscrupulous behaviour, but strong regulation was needed to ensure that um, efficient uh, behaviour emerged. Now, there's one main reason why this structure was required, because, and that's because Ireland was an island. So each generator in the Irish system is a big lump compared to the the system as a whole so if you're a large player in a small market that means that you've got a lot of market power you can act strategically and act strategically so that so that you can influence prices in your favor so because in the Irish system generators had to reveal their bids had to reveal their costs this sort of behavior was was, was ruled out and it worked really well now the downside to that was that interconnectors didn't work so well there was a trade-off basically between these two aspects. Now, we've switched now to a new model called the integrated single electricity market, which interconnectors work a lot better, but um, trading is less transparent. Um, So I could go into more detail, but I think Warren Lynch from the ESRI gives a really good synopsis of this trade-off. So maybe I'll hand you over to her to uh, give us some insight into how this transition has been managed to date. So the old electricity market had an awful lot of regulations that did that job that we were talking about really well, forcing people to compete, forcing people to declare exactly what their price was. Um, the, The problem, or one of the problems with it, was that you didn't actually know for sure what the price was on any particular day until four days later because it took four days for them to crunch the numbers and to figure out what was the demand and what was who was actually generating and how much did it all cost. Now, if you think about it, if you're trying to, to buy and sell electricity between Ireland and, and Great Britain, because that's the only place we're connected to right now, it's really hard to say, OK, well, the price in six hours time in Great Britain is going to be 40 euro per megawatt hour. Should I buy some or not? It's really hard to make that decision if you don't know what the price in Ireland is going to be in six hours' time. If it's going to be €30 in Ireland, you want to buy from Ireland. It's going to be €50 in Ireland, you want to buy from Britain. So the idea behind ISEM was to try to get better trading going over the interconnectors. What we used to have was we had electricity essentially flowing in the wrong direction a lot of the time, not only between Ireland and Britain, but across Europe. This is a problem across Europe. So we've tried to fix that problem. Um, But in so doing, we've had to change how the generators bid. um, And it's not as easy now for us to try to regulate the bids that they were making. Um, ISEM has been live since, uh, for a couple of months now, uh, nearly a year actually. Yeah, yeah. So in in October, it'll mark the the one year anniversary. Um, We had some very interesting pricing events where prices went super, super high, super, super negative. Um, 
I don't want to say emergency, but um, quick quick changes to the regulations in, yeah. with them in mind. So some teething problems were to be expected. I haven't been, I've been keeping an eye on the data, but I haven't been kind of collecting them or crunching any numbers yet, simply because you can't really tell much from the first year. It's, yeah. it's too early to say. Um, but one thing that has been interesting is electricity imports and exports have actually started to show up in the national accounts in the CSO, whereas previously they wouldn't have at all. Right. So it is making a difference in terms of we, we do seem to be seeing certainly more trades, higher volumes of trade. Yeah. Um, we can't quite tell yet whether it's making things more efficient, less efficient, um, and it'll be a tricky enough job to look back historically and see, is there potential for the firms to be exploiting these new rules to maybe get away with some anti-competitive behaviour that they wouldn't have got away with under the old market. It's something we definitely need to be, keep an eye on. It'll be easy enough to verify whether the interconnectors have become more efficient. You know, you just kind of have a look and it's like, well, you know, do we have these perverse flows or have they gone away or have they at least decreased and that kind of thing. Yeah. So we can, we, we should be able to quantify the, well, we'll say benefit, we'll hope it's a benefit at least yeah. over the interconnectors. Um, it'll, it might be a bit harder to see whether there's been an additional cost yeah. in terms of what the firms actually did within Ireland. It gets a bit tricky because it's it, it, an electricity generator, um, you know, a coal or a gas or a, an oil plant. It's a it's a big lump of metal basically, and it's yeah. it's complicated to run. So it's not just like switching on your light and it comes on, and as soon as it comes on, you pay your electricity, and as soon as it switches off, you don't. It actually takes an awful lot of money to start these yokes up, yeah. and then once they're started up, you have to pay money just to keep them going, whether or not they're producing any electricity and then you have the cost of actually producing the electricity so there's three different costs going on there yeah. so under the old system generators used to make what's called a three-part bid so they told the, the regulator here's how much it cost me to start up here's how much it cost me to run my unit and here's how much it cost me to actually produce the electricity um, and we were able to I didn't do any of this but colleagues of ours did where you look at the historical data and you look at the historical prices of coal and gas and carbon and we were able to see are they bidding their true costs or not and the answer was yes they are yeah. you know it was open and transparent we could see exactly what everybody claimed it was costing them and we could see yes they told the truth because that aligns with gas prices and carbon prices and all the rest of it mm. under the new system basically three-part bids aren't compatible with this trading over interconnectors that people do and um, instead in order to trade over interconnectors you just need one day ahead price so the we need to instead get people to just bid, bid one price or there's some some complicated variations on that mm. but it, what they are bidding is a very simplified version of what they used to bid. We can't have three-part bids anymore. And what this means is that generators have to figure out for themselves how to spread the potential cost of them starting over more hours. Um, so they're bearing the risk, which is which is good, yeah. but there's more potential for, that, for them to maybe hide prices and hide costs because we can't kind of say anymore, oh, you're bidding 60 euro but the gas price is only 40, so that doesn't really add up because they could say, oh, well, the reason I'm bidding 60 euro is because I think I'm going to have to start my unit and I have to make enough money to justify the start, the, the cost of starting my unit. Yeah. And the regulator can't really turn around and say, oh, that's wrong. I mean, now they still are monitoring bids and all that kind of thing, and they do have a code of practice, and that's all fine. I don't want to make out that things are awful, yeah. but it's certainly more challenging than it used to be. Okay, so moving on to the next topic, and a lot of people are interested in understanding how the electricity system will operate under increasing shares of renewables. And the big question is, how can we decarbonize electricity if renewables are intermittent? Sometimes the wind doesn't blow, and what do we do then? So, th so there are a number of options on the table here. First of all, we can use conventional generation, and most projections estimate that we will indeed need a certain amount of fossil fuels along the decarbonization pathway. Gas will be especially important as it is flexible and can fill the gaps best when the wind doesn't blow, but it also has less carbon content than other fossil fuels like coal and oil. But how can we minimise the contribution of fossil fuels in the long term? This can be achieved through new technologies such as carbon capture and storage. Basically, we burn a fuel, likely gas, but in an ideal world, biomass and capture the emissions. This is a technology that is still in development and requires much research and development to get to a, a fully commercial and large scale deployment stage. 
But that research and development is something that we'll come back to in a minute. The key point though is that we want to minimise our carbon emissions. And a clever way around doing this is to shift our consumption to the times when the wind isn't blowing. And there are a number of strategies that we can use to achieve this. First of all, we can increase our interconnection. That's the electric links that that allow us to export and import electricity. When the wind doesn't blow, we import it from abroad and vice versa. The second option then is to use demand-side management to shift our demand to times that the wind is blowing. A good example here is an electric vehicle. So for example, you get home from work at 6.30, you plug in your electric vehicle and the wind doesn't blow. Well, at that moment in time, then you're powering our EV from fossil fuels, likely to be gas. But think about it. You don't really care if the car is charged at 6.30 or at 3 a.m. As long as it's ready for you in the morning. Demand side management helps align your charging time with when the wind is blowing or when it's best for the system to, to charge your electric vehicle. So this has applications beyond electric vehicles. Another good example is we all know at home that our fridge cuts in and out intermittently. Well, what if that coincided with when the wind was blowing? Now think of the scope for aligning this with refrigeration for large industrial refrigeration units. Well, in that context, Captain Birdseye can do a lot for, to help us with climate change. The final option then is storage. And I suppose this is the ultimate way that we can align our demand with supply. There are loads of forms of storage with some promising technologies. One would be power to gas technology. That's the use of excess wind or, or electricity. And we turn, use this electricity to turn water into hydrogen or other gases that can be stored and then use as fuel as required. Alongside these technologies, we have battery technologies. And I suppose these are the holy grail. But these technologies are hugely expensive right now and inefficient. We need good research and development policy to improve these technologies and we need to do this soon. So this leads us, leads us nicely to the next topic. What policies do we need? How do we get this research and development? I asked Jacqueline Pless of MIT, and Jacqueline gives a nice overview of the economics behind such support. So basically, it's this idea of trying to align kind of the private benefits of innovation. Um, so those are the benefits that who, the firm investing in R&D itself benefits from that innovation, trying to kind of close the gap between those benefits and the wider benefits to society that occur through these other spillovers. And so kind of the, you know, the optimal level of public investment, therefore, would be whatever that gap is, right? So the gap between kind of social, you know, the social benefits and the private benefits. So Jacqueline then explained how common innovation policies work. And the two most common policies in place at an international level are R&D tax credits and subsidies. Yeah. So um, yeah. So basically, kind of the idea is that these uh, these are these tax credits as well as a direct subsidy. What it's doing is, uh, you know, it's a, when I say a direct subsidy or grant, this is basically you know cash in hand for a company to invest in something. You know, you, you oftentimes you know they're won through some type of competitive um, uh, like a, a competition for grant money, right? So say there's like a pot of money. Um, it's uh, you, Give a concrete example. In in the UK, there is Innovate UK, which invests. It's a pot of money essentially that is strictly for kind of private businesses and some universities and things like this for different either technologies or problems that need to be resolved. And you, as a, as a company, you can kind of bid into these different competitions for the money um, based upon some proposed project. And so, you'd say you have a project idea that fits into the climate change bucket or biotech or something along those lines. And uh, you have a project that you think, you know, is budgeted for, say, uh, 200,000 pounds. And maybe if you win one of these grants, it's going to give you, um, say, 50 per- it's going to cover, say, 50 percent of those costs. And so it's basically cash in hand to um, invest in the project that you want to do invest in. Um, and so it's, it's essentially reducing the cost of investing in R&D from the firm's from the company's perspective. And so, for instance, it could be that um, without that 100,000 pounds, uh, 50% of your budget covered, you may not have been able to pursue that project in the first place. And so that's, that's of course, going to kind of get you over that initial hurdle of being able to invest in your project. Um, and then, you know, for firms that maybe are a little bit more R&D intensive already or already have some established um, projects underway, 
you know, they, they still could be somewhat financially constrained or budget constrained. And, and so to the point where either a direct grant could reduce the cost of investing in whatever that next bit of the project is or expanding on an existing project. Um, but similarly, you know, a tax credit could do the same. Of course, it's usually these things come at it, it's slightly different because they come at different times. So they're less likely to help maybe for getting you over that hurdle of investing in the first place. But if you have, you know, projects underway and, and you're planning, you know, your financials for the year and, and you know that you're going to be getting a generous tax credit at the end of the day, at the end of the year, um, as is the case in the UK, then you can kind of plan it, that into your budgeting where it's, you know, say almost 30% of your, your R&D budget is going to be coming back to you. And so this might help, you know, with that reduction in cost, you can invest, invest in more. So the next question then on everybody's lips is, well, what is the difference between these policies? And Jacqueline gives a nice explanation. Ultimately, right. So they're, they're, sim- they're very similar in the sense that they're both kind of reducing the cost of investing in R&D. But when the, I think some of the, the main differences really are maybe on uh, so the timing issue, which is something that I mentioned. So it's either, you know, with a grant, you're typically getting this up front. So if you are you are very financially constrained and not able to invest in the first place, then getting a subfront grant is really going to be crucial to getting your project off the ground, um, up and running. And so that wouldn't, you know, whereas the tax credit will come later. So that that's one subtle difference. Another difference that um, a difference between the two that will differ across countries is kind of the level of certainty in them as well. So for instance, in the UK, the tax credit scheme has been, you know, it, it is permanent and uh, reliable and has only been increasing, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, if anything. So basically, since it was enacted in 2000, it was enacted as kind of a, a permanent thing and then has just become more generous. Um, and so you can really kind of plan on that level of certainty, um, whereas a grant, you really have to, you don't really know up front whether you're going to be winning that grant or not. So there might be differences in certainty, but then that, that's also going to differ depending on where you are. So in the, in the U.S., um, for a long time, up until just a couple of years ago, the, the R&D tax credit, from my understanding, was that it was kind of renewed each year. And so with such, such uncertainty in the tax credit, um, you know, winning some type of grant actually may have been the more, the more certain way to go. Um, so it really kind of, di- there are a lot of different subtle things, uh, subtleties that um, vary. So generally, it is often best to have one policy intervention to correct for one market failure. Uh, but often there are subsidies layered on top of other benefits, such as tax credits. Jacqueline gives us some insight into when layering policies on top of each other might be a good thing and when it might not necessarily give any additional benefit. Yeah, so it depends. Right. So um, I think it's, it's really common uh, for uh, government policymakers to start to kind of layer on different policies that are trying to target very similar issues. So we see this in, in various spaces, but in the innovation space, we would think about, say, OK, we're layering. We have all of these. Uh, we have direct grant schemes for R&D and we have these other say um, prizes and, and competitions for grant schemes. But then we also offer all of these R&D tax incentives and other types of breaks. And so there becomes this question of, you know, so oftentimes when we're laying these things on top of each other, it's kind of framed in this like, oh, these are complementary policies. Of course, they're all enhancing each other and firms can kind of take advantage of all of them. Um, but there's there's always also this question of whether we are subsidizing some type of spending or some type of activity that a private entity, a private organization or business would have invested in anyway without that public Right, and so in that sense, then, then that would be the, you know that's a, that's a waste of public resources essentially. And so, you know, really we should only be putting public money into um, the marginal type of investment, right? So the, the investment that you know maybe wouldn't have been wouldn't a company would not have made without that subsidy. And so as soon as we're kind of in the space of, of perhaps you know if um, firms are able to take advantage of public subsidies that they don't necessarily needs to say they would have been investing in this project anyway, and therefore it's not creating any additionality. It's not creating additional investments. It's just displacing their own private spending. Um, This is where, you know, it gets dangerous and we want to make sure that we're um, designing policies in the right way and and thinking about the entire policy mix and how, how these different subsidies and incentives are interacting 
um, and not just thinking of them in their own siloed space and, and under, trying to understand the, the, the impacts of each one individually, but actually seeing what are, what are the interaction effects of these different policies. So in some of my recent work, I mean, I, I showed exactly that. So we, I take a look at kind of the interaction of, of direct grants and tax credits. And um, what, what I find is that the, the interaction of the two is, uh, is very positive for small firms that are more likely to be financially constrained. Um, so kind of getting this kind of upfront grants and then some type of tax credit in addition to that for other types of expenditures is really, it's a complementary type of relationship where the effects kind of enhance each other. Um, but then for, for larger firms that perhaps are a little bit more established or where they don't have these binding financial constraints, um, we see the kind of this, this very counterintuitive dampening effect of the two where, where firm, larger firms that are receiving grants already and then receive a tax credit on top of that, it appears as though those tax credits are basically just displacing um, funds that the, the firm would have been investing on its own anyway. So, so there's definitely a lot to think about even kind of within these um, within countries, um, you know, this can, these types of effects and relationships can differ depending on the type of the company, whether it's firm size or ownership or, or other kind of lines of, of differences. Okay, so the final section of our podcast today is looking at how the electricity market is going to develop in the long term. So we mentioned earlier that new smart technologies are going to become more commonplace in the home. Technologies like your car, your water heater, even your fridge will soon be programmed to shift their electricity consumption. And if we have a time of use tariff, consumption can be shifted to when it is cheapest to generate. So that makes much better use of the electricity system and it's much cheaper for the householder. Now, if we couple these new technologies with household level solar generation and perhaps a household battery like a battery in your electric vehicle or these new Tesla power walls, well then we have all the tools necessary to trade with the grid. We can act as an electricity trader. We have the electricity generation and we have the storage and we can sell and buy at times that prices are favorable to do so. Now, this is becoming a big topic in countries like Australia, where there's a lot of sun and current solar technologies can take best advantage of the conditions. And this is becoming an increasingly hot topic in European countries like Germany, the UK and Ireland. And as solar technology develops, well, it will become increasingly on the agenda. So personally, I think this is great for competition and it should help bring down market prices. So I asked Murren her thoughts and we, we discussed this topic, but we soon move on to discussing the importance of efficient electricity tariffs to reap the full benefits of these future developments. So the technical term for that would be an oligopoly with a competitive fringe. Sure. So we've got um, we've got the big energy companies, um, but then as you get more and more people who are maybe generating themselves at home, being a prosumer or whatever, they're that what that really means is they're demanding electricity less electricity when 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 it's sunny or whatever, and then they're maybe maybe even selling a bit of electricity to the grid then. So that definitely reduces the the, the net demand. It provides a bit of competition. Um, but as long as there are kind of individual distributed houses, they're not really going to be able to get together and price in a way that an energy company would. Um, now, they could form some kind of a co-op or, or an aggregator or something yeah. who, who prices on their on their behalf. Um, and, you know, more competition is, is generally good, um, except under cer- certain circumstances. Uh, but there could be other issues as well in that... If you think about it, there are fixed costs to electricity generation as well um, in terms of the network. We need an awful lot of wires to distribute electricity around the place, and we all need to pay for those. Um, and if, if, uh, if you and I consume the same amount of electricity, but you're producing 20% of yours, whereas I'm buying 100% of mine from the grid, then that means you're only paying 80% of the the cost of the wires that I'm paying because some of what you pay for your electricity goes to pay the wires and that kind of thing. So we're using the same grid and we're kind of using it the same amount because you're relying on it as much as I am, Mm. but you're contributing less to it. So that could have some issues as well in terms of how do we actually pay for the fixed cost of the grid and should we start to regulate that aspect? So I agree with your point on that if everybody is trading at a, at a small scale level and the amount of electricity that each household produces is peanuts compared to what 
like a, a coal plant would produce. But then there are all these models of aggregators and virtual power plants where which gather all the electricity up and then bid as as one. So that could sort of help overcome some of these issues but uh, especially if you have storage there as well because yeah. if it's just a case of well everybody has a solar pv panel and we'll lump them all together well then great but you can still only trade when the sun is shining yeah it doesn't really but change if you much. have storage as well then that then they are getting into the realm of kind of being a dispatchable generator they're still more constrained yeah. than if you have a gas turbine or whatever but they're getting close so Muren mentioned the issue of householders generating their own electricity and contributing less towards the maintenance of the grid. Now this is a big issue and has become known as the utility debt spiral. And it becomes a debt spiral as once it gains traction it can gather pace quite quickly, as Muren explains. It's a kind of a drip drip as well, you know, the more people who move, the more expensive it becomes for the people who don't move, which means more people will move. And Absolutely. eventually you get stuck with just a tiny proportion of people you know in the worst case scenario you just get stuck with a tiny proportion of people who are bearing all the cost um, and they're the least able to afford that cost but they're also the least able to move off grid themselves because they don't have the resources yeah. so it's definitely uh, it's it's an issue that's being thrown up in places like Germany and that kind of thing I think we need to get ahead of the game here in Ireland because the last thing we want is to realise you know yeah. five years too late oh gosh this is a problem let's try to fix it and then you're you know the people who happen to move early are you know happy days for them because you can't go changing their contracts retrospectively and stuff it's yeah. probably something that we should we should really crunch the numbers on this and get some some clever legislation and or some yeah. clever regulation in place sooner rather than later so Marin provides a nice segue into some of the work i've been done in this space and the, the solution i've found is that we need to fix the tariffs that we pay we need to pay for the fixed cost that is the wires and the infrastructure. Through our standing charge, we need to pay for the units we consume through our volumetric charge. That way, if I substitute away some of my consumption, I still pay my share of maintenance to the grid. And this is not the case at the moment, and we need to find a way to guide tariffs back, or else we'll be facing the spiraling cost for users that are left on the grid. And as far as I'm aware, it's at the retailer's discretion. You know, they, yeah. they have to... They have to pay for whatever amount of the fixed charge that, that they're liable yeah. for um, based on, yeah. on their consumer book. But it's completely up to them how they yeah. raise that revenue. Um, yeah. And at the moment, they raise it, as you say, more on the variable side and less on the fixed side. Um, so there, there could potentially be an argument for regulating that and for saying, well, you know, you have to raise... The fixed charge yeah. portion through fixed charges, yeah. you're not allowed to put it onto the variable charge. Well, it, it but then there's arguments against against over-regulating prices as well, yeah. because then you're, you're eroding your competition. So regulation is one potential solution, but also we could encourage competition. And I asked Marin whether this was a potential solution to this problem. I mean, it certainly is true, theoretically at least, that if everybody switched, then we'd be perfectly competitive. And if, if everybody just switched supplier every year and went to the cheapest supplier, then all these problems, well, a lot of these problems would go away on the retail side. Yeah. Uh, but we know from the behavioural literature that people just don't do that. Um, most people don't switch regularly. Some people never switch, no matter what. And even more depressingly, sometimes when people do switch, they don't choose the best alternative tariff and sometimes they even choose a worse tariff. Yeah. So trying to rely on everybody switching as your main drive of toward competition is, is a hopeless policy. Yeah. It's never going to get us there. And furthermore, what most energy companies do is they have these uh, they're called teaser rates or discount rates where you sign up for the first year and you get a, a, a discounted tariff for the first year. Um, and then after that, you go on to their standing tariff their, their, or their, their standard tariff. Mm -hmm. So the people, the maybe, you know, people like me, the nerds who, who, who look this up every year, we're getting a great deal because we're just getting a discounted tariff every single year. Yeah. But if there's somebody who's just not going to switch, if you know that you have even one customer, theoretically, who's never, ever going to switch, then you're going to charge them a million euro per milliwatt hour and you're going to make a fortune off them yeah. and you don't care how much you have to discount your discounted tariff to get all the other consumers because you're not making money off them you're making money off the people who aren't moving yeah. now of course nobody's going to go to a million euro per milliwatt hour but the point stands which is if you have people who are highly unlikely to switch mm. then you can charge them very high prices and that is the complete opposite of what competition is supposed to bring about. It's supposed yeah. to bring about the lowest possible price. Yeah. 
Okay, so thanks to everybody for listening to episode five. I hope this served as a good primer into electricity economics and hopefully I'll delve deeper into different aspects that were explored here in future episodes. If you like the podcast, remember to follow us on at Irish Econ Pod on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Five star Apple reviews are important currency. So as we're approaching the end of our first series and trying to get some support for a second series, a five star review would help put a shoulder to the wheel and, and help us get up the line there. So, so thanks to everybody. Thanks again and all the best.